Today is going to be all about iterators and collections and the different pitfalls that we come across. And this is all going to be based on real world examples. I'd love to hear from you in the comments. What real world examples have you seen come up from either using iterators or from using collections causing you problems in your production code or in your real projects that you work on outside of work? What we're going to be diving into today is looking at some examples of using collections, how that will translate into some performance impact. We're going to follow up with looking at how an iterator can try to solve that and then we're going to follow up with how we might be able to clean that up. All right, let's go look at the code. All right, I'm here in Visual Studio. I have quite a large comment here. Um, I'm just showing you this because this is actually going to be checked in on the public GitHub repository. I will have a link in the description so you can go check all this out. You can play with these examples. This is going to be based on some of my real world experience but the examples themselves aren't going to be actually lifted out of production code or something like that. The first thing we're going to look at is what I would call probably the more common case. You'd write a function that's going to actually go talk to a database. So again, I'm kind of simulating all this, but you're going to return uh, a, an actual materialized list of the data that you're sending back from the database. So on the surface, nothing seems wrong with this. To simulate kind of maybe what a real database might look like, I actually have something like a thread.sleep here in the beginning. Five seconds is definitely exaggerated, but I wanted to show it having an impact in the console as we're stepping through these examples. So I'm, I'm also going to be printing to the console so we can see some timestamps when this completes. And because we're not looking at an iterator to start with, we're actually just going to be creating the collection of results. We're going to simulate pulling back uh, 100,000 results, putting them into a collection, and then returning them. So I have seen code like this in production many, many times where all of the results of your database query get jammed into a collection, whether it's a list or something else. And then after the function is finished, we return that whole collection back. This little bit of code here, it's really, again, just to simulate. So when I go to press play on this, we'll see the impact of it. What follows is really just some information so we can see how long stuff's taking, and then we can go look at the memory consumption. We can see we're getting data from the database using the list. It has finished, as it says, connecting, you know, getting data from the database. It's starting to stream it back. This is all contrived and made up right now. But this part here is going to basically wait 100 millisecond or 100 iterations before it sleeps for a millisecond, and then we're going to get the results back. We can see uh, between these two lines in the console that we're waiting five seconds. That corresponds with this initial delay connecting to the database, like the simulation part. And then from there, we go from 21 to 37. So if my mental math is correct, that's about 16 seconds to actually get all of the data back into a collection. So that's a full, what, 21 seconds just to pull 100,000 records back. Obviously, I'm <laughs> I'm making up the actual delays, so please don't, uh, you know, anchor yourself too much to that. But the other thing that I want to call out that we can see here is that we actually had a memory increase of 10 megabytes so we had a lot of memory allocated just to be able to basically do two things. Check if we have data and count the data. And just to show you where those two things are in the code, again, right here, because we have this database results list and then we're asking for any and count. What's going on here? How does an iterator actually avoid this? Because that's a lot of memory to allocate just to be able to do these two things, right? just to be able to know is there data and just to be able to know the count of the data. For those of you that have actually built software that connects out to databases and done this before, you might stop and say, well, why are you using a dumb query like that? Why would you not just go write a purpose-built query that can go do, you know, a check, uh, you know, has data or a check that, or a query that actually does counting on the database side and returns it? Yes, you can absolutely do that. My point with this example is that in real code, I have absolutely seen this kind of thing come up. And this is actually one of the, the instances that people run into where using full collections like this will cause them some headaches. So how do iterators help here? Well, let's try it out in the next part of this example. So we have a similarly structured function and we're going to notice that I have a yield return in here. So having the yield return makes this function actually an iterator now. 
unlike the one before this, which put everything into a list and just returned the list without a yield return. We still have the same amount of sleep. This part's still the same as well. You can pause the video, go back and check it, or check the source online if you don't believe me. But everything here is structured the same except this yield return. I have something, I have a couple more print uh, lines here just to be able to, to demonstrate some interesting things that are happening. We're now familiar with iterators and the fact that they are more like a function pointer. So you can tell this line on 83 will essentially complete instantly because we're not actually performing the iteration at this point in time. It's only when we start to materialize the iterator that we have to pay a performance impact because that's when it's actually doing the work and not just pointing at the function. Now we'll run this. I will zoom in. Now if we're checking out the timestamps here, we can see that between the first two lines here, there's essentially no time. And that's just because that we know an iterator when we assign it to a variable is just a function pointer. It's not actually performing the execution of that function. We actually only paid the uh, performance impact of the iterator um, on the, the simulated database connection of five seconds when we tried to see if we had data and then we pay the full price to go count all of the data, right? So has data, right? We take all of the results from this, assign it to this variable database results iterator right here, right? And then we're going to call any and count on it. And any and count are link methods that will start to force some enumeration over that result set. So when we call any, like I said, we're going to pay that five second penalty. And then all of a sudden it's going to see that it has at least one result. It stops right away. Cool. So five second penalty on that. And then to actually go count, we're going to pay that five second penalty. And we're going to go pay the rest of the penalty to start reading all the items back. So we're going to come back to that in a sec. Why did that happen twice? That's something interesting. But the other interesting thing is if we look at the amount of memory that we use, it is significantly smaller. We're talking, if I do like rough uh, byte math here, um, you know, 25 kilobytes versus the 10 megabytes. And this is because we haven't actually taken those results and stored the whole result set in memory. We didn't need to. We only needed to go one at a time. So that's very interesting. So, well, why did we end up paying a performance hit twice by doing two actual database connections, right? We can see here DB now sending back results and DB now sending back results. Something's weird about this. Why did that happen twice? And it comes back to any and count. Okay, so why does this happen? Well, it stems from the fact that an iterator is more like a function pointer than an actual materialized collection. That's a really important point. So how do we go fix this? Well, let's go look at the next little bit of code. All right, so we're still using the same function to iterate. However, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to say on our iterator, we're going to call to list on it, materialize the whole result set, and then we can call any and count on the iterator. So what's going to go happen when we do that? Some of you that are keen will already know the impact of this. So there's the first DB now sending back results. So that's like one database connection so far. And our goal here is to avoid two. So it looks like we're still paying that performance impact of having to go get the data set. So wait a second here. We just paid the full performance impact and we're right back to allocating 10 megabytes. What the heck is going on here? Why, like, why would anyone go do this then? Well, let's go see what we can actually change to make this better. So this is a demonstration, actually, of two things in a row where using an iterator can actually lead to behavior that you might not have been expecting, right? Because if you end up calling two list on it and it's a large result set, you're back at square one for materializing the whole thing, not what you want. So let's be smarter about what we're doing here. All right, so what does this code do now? Well... Because this is a little bit of a contrived example, what we can do is that we don't actually ever need the full result set to know if we have data and to know the count of that data, 
Sure, we have to go enumerate the full result set to actually count it, but we don't need to hold all of those values in memory. We never use them for this case. So what we could do instead is actually count, right? We can use link to count the full set first, just store the count, and then we know if we have data, and then we know the count right after. So we can get away with doing just one iterator call the whole way through the result set. Okay, great. Now let's pay special attention to the timestamps that we have here. So we can see that we start off, we like basically in every case, we pay that five second penalty for sending back data from the database. Then we pay the full penalty of getting all of the data, right? That full time penalty. So from 33 to 48, 15 seconds. Now you'll notice that to check has data, it's basically instant. To check the count, basically instant. And when we check the memory increase, we can see that it's not the 10 megabytes anymore, it's still the 25K. So in this particular example, we could use an iterator to actually get us the answers we wanted without allocating everything. Okay, so yes, these are slightly contrived examples, admittedly, but these are examples of things that I have seen in production code. So just to kind of call some things out here that I think are important, and I mentioned this earlier, but yes, you could and potentially should go write different database queries to get you those results, and you could do that without having to use iterators at all, right? You could go write a query that checks to see if data exists. You could go write a whole second query to go perform a count and do that on the database side, get you one result back that's the count. Yes, you could do that. And my point here is that literally in production over many years, I have seen this type of thing come up where people don't. And they don't because they think that they have access to it at their fingertips using these methods. And they don't realize the performance hit that they're paying. Now, the other part is that when we have iterators and we're talking about flexibility, you still run into a similar set of problems, except it's more on the performance impact of timing versus the memory allocation. And that's because people aren't totally aware that iterators act like function pointers and not like materialized collections. So when you start calling things like any or count, different types of things on your unmaterialized uh, iterators, you end up performing the iteration block again. And depending on what's happening under the hood, that could be very expensive. All right, so just a quick recap for today. We ended up looking at some contrived examples that reflect real world examples between iterators and collections and some of the pitfalls that people run into. So my question to you is, first of all, did that make sense? Have you seen this kind of thing come up in production code at work? Or have you been encountering some things like this in your own hobby code? I'd love to hear in the comments or if you have different thoughts about different challenges you run into, let's hear below as well. So thank you for watching. If you found this interesting, please give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and feel free to share this with other people you know that are having challenges with iterators and collections in C-Sharp. Thanks and we'll see you next time.